last week to look at some things out of the book of Deuteronomy where Moses, I, I, I almost want to call him Grandpa Moses. Anyhow, if you can just envision that we've got Moses in his elderly years working with a new group of people. The unbelievers have perished. And now he is, he's reiterating his heart's desire, God's heart's desire for this people who are about to enter into this new land. So, so Moses is, is, is like setting these folks down and this is grandfatherly advice and wisdom and inspiration that God is giving through him. And he's using a phrase and he uses it very often through the book of Deuteronomy and it's the phrase, be careful. If you were with us last week, we looked at the first four, be carefuls. Be careful about your teaching. We found how that, uh, that Moses made it very, very plain that what we teach, if we, if we neglect to, re to reflect and to teach upon the Word of God, things are not going to go the way we would like for them to go. Also about be careful what you worship. We talked about the fact that we need to be careful to make sure that we walk the path of obedience. And lastly, we talked about don't forget God. So we covered those four and announced that we would continue that, uh, that this morning, and so we do so with number five, be careful who you please. Be careful who you please. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, Moses gives Israel some instructions concerning the complete destruction of the places that they're going to find where the Canaanites worshipped, and he wants them to annihilate those places, to tear them down lest they be tempted to use them themselves. He identifies that what's been happening in, to those, in those places is false worshipers have been utilizing those things. And he says that each one has been doing just exactly as he sees fit. In other words, this, the religion of the Canaanites was whatever makes you happy is what you ought to be doing. And God says, I want you to tear all that down. He continues with that thought now in verses 13 and 14. Be careful not to sacrifice your burnt offerings anywhere you please. In other words, you're going into a land where people were doing exactly what they wanted. Now, I want you to understand you don't offer sacrifices just any place. Offer them only at the place the Lord will choose in, in one of your tribes and there observe everything that I command you. God makes it very plain. I don't want you doing just whatever you please. I want to be the one who is establishing the practices of worship. God would be very specific where those Jewish sacrifices would be, would be made. Moses' warning is against following our human fancy and doing the things that anyone pleases. Now, I think that's a warning worthy for us modern worshipers today as well, don't you? That we need to be careful that we're just not worshiping as we please. Worship focus can easily become little more than a search for pleasing and appeasing one's own human desires. And again, those can, can be justifiable things the way we like stuff, but we need to be careful not to do just as we please. A Frenchman on one occasion visited the United States for the first time. He went back home and wrote back to some friends and said, my observation is that you Americans have three idols. And those three idols are size, noise, and speed. <laughs> you can, you can, I'll let you ponder that and, and, uh, and process that on your own. But here's my question. Could it be that those truly are our idols in our culture? And that those have infiltrated and become weeds within even weekly worship? Here's what I'm talking about. Have size, noise, and speed pressed personal pleasure into the place of principal priorities? Could it be that we have lost sight and just made it about pleasing us? For example, true worship, true worship is about our smallness and God's size. That's what true worship is, is it not? Isn't worship literally, the word means kissing the hand, in worship, do we not humble ourselves, belittle ourselves, lower ourselves, make ourselves smaller so that we can make God bigger? Isn't that the purpose of worship? How about this? Isn't worship about stopping the noise so that we can hear that still, small voice of God? 
Don't we assemble so that we can block out some of all the, the noise of the world and the noise of society and the noise of our lives? Don't we come here so that we can have some quiet and worship God? And how about this? Isn't it about learning to negate our quest for speed and to slow down enough to wait on the Lord? Aren't those principles of worship? And yet if we look at what's happening in the last three decades of the public worship in the Christian community at large, what's been accelerated? What's been the focus? Mega churches are magnificent. The noisier, the better. We get this thing going and it's non-stop. It's everything is hype. Everything is fast. We get there, we get done, we get out. Aren't those the things plaguing many worship gatherings today? Maybe those idols have more influence than we think. But being careful about pleasing self is not just a principle that takes place within this building. Being careful about who we please is a principle that comes into our daily life. In the day-to-day, -day, who am I pleasing? That's a very significant question. And asking, am I just doing what I desire or am I doing to please God? That's a very important question. John chapter 8, Jesus said this, The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Now watch what Christ says. For I always do what pleases him. Boy, I wish I could say that. And that's probably your response too, as we read what Jesus says. I always please my Father. Well, yeah, you, you, were, you were perfect, and so, so we understand that. But I think more importantly is why was that such an objective for Jesus? Jesus kind of gives us the answer to that. He says, first of all, God sent me. He sent me, so I want to please him. He also is with me. I am never any place that he isn't, so I want to please him. And God has not left him. He's never deserted him. So those are the reasons why Jesus says, it's my objective to always please God. Now we know his perfection enabled him to do that. But here's what I want to focus on, folks. The same motivations that Jesus had for trying to please God in all that he did should be the same motivations for us, should they not? God has sent you. Do you believe that? Do you believe your life has some eternal purpose? Some divine destiny? God is always with you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? God will never leave you. Do you process that? Do you comprehend that? So, if all of those things are true for us as well, does it not then automatically become our objective to always please God, just like it was for Jesus. When outside of our corporate worship, are we as intent on pleasing God? At home, at the workplace, at school, while we're recreating. <laughs> I have watched Christians at sporting events and you would not know that they were Christ followers. Do we make it our objective to always please God? Moses says, you be careful who you please. You be careful who you please. We're either going to please us or we're going to please Yahweh. It's you or Yahweh. Those are the, those are the uh, two possibilities. Be careful not to forget the Levites. Be careful not to forget the Levites. Now, you, you've been reading through this uh, uh, schedule. You know that the Levites didn't, were not going to be given a land in Canaan. They were going to live in different cities. Uh, but the people were responsible to be careful not to neglect the Levites as long as you live in your land. The Levites were not given the possession. They were dependent upon the gifts. Thus Moses urges carefulness in being generous towards those who give themselves to that full-time service of the Lord and to the people. To think that such support only needs to be supplied when leaders meet one's expectations is contrary to Moses' instruction because what he says is you're supposed to do that as long as you live in the land. It isn't about them, it's about you. As long as you are living in the promises of God, then you take care of this. Moses is speaking of giving servants a multifaceted support. Obviously, the Levites were provided for physically as 1 Corinthians chapter 9 Paul will reiterate and actually use a quote from Deuteronomy 
about not muzzling an ox who's doing the work. There was also emotional support that was to be given to those that were leading. Hebrews chapter 13 shows us that even under the new system, that that, that is to happen, that those who are in leadership position are to view what they're able to do and what they're doing as a joy, not a burden. And that depends upon how supportive those who are following are going to choose to be. So be careful who you please. Be careful not to forget the Levites. Be careful about your thoughts. Be careful about your thoughts. The prophet Moses is going to express the importance of guarding our thoughts. I want you to, I want to just preface this passage by asking you to look how easy it is for people who are following God to distort and to rationalize. It, it, it just takes such a little amount of twist. And all of a sudden, the thoughts no longer are those that are pleasing God, we're pleasing self. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought, okay? Thought. Be careful. Then he begins this discussion. The seventh year, the year of canceling debts, is near, so that you do not show ill will toward the needy brother and give him nothing. He may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you may be found guilty of sin. Okay, it's about the time to forgive the debt. And if you loan to someone in November, and in January you have to forgive the debt, you don't get much in return. So he says, what begins to happen is people say, you know what, I'm, I'm just not going to do this. Because the time of forgiving this debt is too close. There's not going to be any return on this. Verse 10, give generously to him and do so without a grudging heart. Then, because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all of your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your brothers and toward the poor and the needy of your land. Be careful about what you choose to think about. Be careful what kind of things enter your mind. Because what will happen is we can rationalize so quickly the commands of God and, be and begin to process a different way of living that is foreign to God. I, I debated about putting this in here, but I, I, I'm going to. R.C. Sproul is a, is a, is a reformist. Uh, he has a lot of good material. He has some things that he's off on, just like most of us. But the things that he, he, he has some things that he just really nails. And this, this is a quote that I think really portrays the point that Moses is trying to make. When I was a teenager, I wasn't a Christian, and I grew up before the sexual revolution. I grew up when it was still considered a matter of ethics to keep your virginity until you were married. When I was a young man, I heard an older boy talk about his thrilling experience that he had had sexually with a girl that lived up the street. My eyes were like saucers. I had never heard anything like this before. He said, try it, you'll like it. So I did. And here's what happened. I came home, went upstairs to the bathroom, and threw up. I was so sick with guilt. But I learned very quickly how to sear my conscience. And I changed not my behavior, but my ethical standards. I adjusted my ethical standards downward to accommodate my behavior. And I'm not the only man who's ever done that. Most of our ethical theories we develop to excuse ourselves. That's how easy it is for us to pollute our thoughts. 
And that is the message that I see. That's the warning that Moses is giving. Do not adjust your ethical standards downward to accommodate your behavior. We don't make what God says fit our corruptions. We let what God says pull us up to a higher way of living, a higher ethic. And Moses says, you be careful about your thoughts. Because that's where all of this is going to take place. If we're not in the Word, planting the spiritual seeds that it holds, we'll never be able to grow any of the fruit of controlling fleshly thoughts. The Word is what will produce the new thoughts that will fight off the fleshly thoughts. Paul speaks profoundly concerning that when he writes this. We demolish arguments and every pretense. Folks, he's saying these thoughts that are lowered to our behavior. We demolish that and that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We've got to capture our thoughts, bring them to obedience. I like the new living here. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Lastly, be careful about attitudes that you choose to possess towards those that lead. Be careful about the attitudes that you choose to possess towards those that lead. Zig Ziglar one time said, your Christian attitude is contagious. And then I asked the questions, is yours worth catching? Christian attitudes are contagious. Is yours worth catching? Here's the warning as Moses puts it. Go to the priest, who are Levites, and to the judge, who is in office at that time. Inquire of them, and they will give you the verdict. You must act according to the decision they give you in the place the Lord will choose. Be careful to do everything they direct you to do. Act according to the law they teach you and the decisions they give you. Do not turn aside from what they tell you to the right or to the left. We've read much about leadership as we have journeyed through the Pentateuch, those first five books of the Old Testament. We have, uh, have seen how that there was punishment that God actually inflicted when there was disrespect for his leadership that was shown and demonstrated by the people. Now as they enter and prepare to enter this new land, Moses reminds Israel. And he says, the man who shows contempt for the judge or for the priest who stands uh, ministering there to the Lord your God must be put to death. You must purge the evil from Israel. Moses says, you know what? There are people who are willing to lead, and you'd better not be contemptuous toward them. The word means to be presumptuous or proud. It comes from a root word, which means to seethe or to be insolent. I had never caught in Stephen's recounting of this history, I'd never caught this phrase, where he says, that the people in their hearts turned back to Egypt. Now, you, we've read about the complaint, right? We want to go back. to Why did you bring us out here to die? Back in Egypt, we had the fish and the leeks and the onions. and let us, We need to pick us a new leader who will take us back to Egypt. Now, they didn't. But you know what? They didn't have to. <laughs> the reason they didn't have to is because they chose to go back there in their hearts. And those people rejected God's leadership to head to the promised land. Paul offers a similar warning to those who stand on the edge of a different promised land. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. The word that, that Paul uses for respect is built from two different Greek words, the one meaning to gaze and the other meaning to, be, to discern or to see something clearly. We put that all together, and the admonition is this. Followers are to look upon leaders with a discerning gaze of authentic, self-imposed clarity. Living by that standard 
according to Paul, will bring the follower and the leader to a place of peaceful coexistence. What I, what I find amazing in all this, folks, is that each of us bear the responsibility to do this. To force ourselves to be clear in our understanding. It's so easy for us to get off on a tangent. To get sucked up into something that we are not going to gaze upon with clarity. We're not going to gain the information we need to clear it up. We're going to hear something, draw conclusions, and function from that. And far too often, far too often, those things are very unpeaceful. The conclusions we reach are very unpeaceful. The reason for carefully guarding one's attitude towards leaders is not because of anything that leaders have achieved. It's not because they, they have met my personal expectations, so they've made me happy, so therefore... I'm supposed to regard them highly. They are not and never will be people of exact correctness. Mistakes have been, are being, and will continue to be made by every leader who ever leads. So the whole concept of respecting has nothing to do with performance. Now, obviously there are leaders who don't perform well. That's not the point. The point is we are told to respect them. We're told to honor them. Why are we going to honor them? Most often we assume we honor them when they meet my expectations and they perform well. That's most often what we assume. That's most often how we handle this. Leaders, however, are not honored because they represent the picture of person of, of person or perf and personification of perfection. And I think all you have to do is to remember Moses. Moses' leadership was imperfect. He was plagued both in his plan and in his practice. But God said, he's the leader. He's my man. God commands this respect because of the leader's work. <laughs> That's what Paul said. You admire, you honor because of the work. It is a labor of love. I thought about how I could illustrate this, and there's a couple of paths that, that kind of came to my mind. One has to do with most of us are not tremendous technological wizards when it comes to operating our computers. Most of us, you know, we do what we do, and it, it needs to work in order for us to do what we do. And if it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, it puts us into a tailspin. And, and every time that happens, I'm so thankful that my son works with computers because it is a call to Jansen. This is happening. What can I do about it? He gives me some information. Usually things turn around. Okay, what happens every time that I call him is I appreciate him for his work. Now, he's my son, and I appreciate him for those reasons, and there's a lot of other things. But when my computer is messed up, it's not about whether he disobeyed me when he was six years old. It's about his work. And folks, that's what we need to strive for, for those that are willing to lead. We respect them for their work. Not because of an achievement, but what they're willing to do. Here's the other illustration. I'm going to go ahead and use them both. They're both pretty good. Every place I have ever been, when a congregation has sought to add leaders... I have heard those who have been asked to serve as leaders. I can't do that. You say, what are you, what are you talking about? I can't be scrutinized like you are. I can't put myself in a position where people are going to look at me. I can't, I can't, I can't. You know what those folks are saying? They're saying there's a work to leadership. And I don't see that I can do that. Folks, we need to respect those who say they can because they've said yes. They've said yes. A church member who was known for their leader bashing ability approached the preacher one time and said, I've got a, a question about heaven. When I get there, I don't know how I'm going to be able to wear a robe over my wings without bending them. The somewhat less than tactful but very honest preacher <laughs> Responded, 
If I were you, I wouldn't worry about that. I'd worry about how you're going to get your halo over your horns. <laughs> In the book of Deuteronomy, we have found eight be carefuls. That's an octave. You can make all kinds of music with an octave of notes. We can make all kinds of spiritual music that glorifies God when we learn to function within these be carefuls, within this spiritual octave. Be careful what we teach. Be careful what we worship. Be careful to walk in obedience. Be careful to not forget God. Be careful who you are about pleasing. Be careful not to forget the Levites. Be careful to guard your thoughts and be careful on the attitudes that we choose to hold towards those that lead. How resolved are we today? We have been reading about a, uh, a people that God gave very specific regulations and laws to those people. We talked Wednesday night some about the amazing fact that even that law that was chiseled in stone, in God's mind, he wanted it in their hearts. That's what God, there's repeatedly Moses writes of love, God loves you, he wants you to love him back. He wanted that law to not just be on hard stone, he wanted it to be in the softness of the hearts of the people. That's what he wants today. And during our time of history, he has not left a chiseled stone. He sent flesh and blood who allowed himself, if you will, to be chiseled onto a cross. And he took that law that was contrary to us and, and he put it to death. And he developed a new testament, a new will. And he said, I am here. I and the Father are one. I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. And he said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Jesus gives us that invitation. Are you resolved today to give yourself to him? To live within the octave and make spiritual music.